in uh, today's message and uh, next Sunday's message, we'll be looking at uh, specific issues that have come up over the last 25 years that have affected in one way or another our assembly and that have in a way defined us as well. Some things have happened behind the scenes, others have happened more broadly uh, to others in the assembly, but all of it, all of it relevant to our ministry. And uh, we'll be looking at it under the title, Who Are We and Where Are We Going? These are things that keep popping up and uh, have come up over the years. And uh, we'll be addressing that today and next Sunday as well. The first point is, who are we? Well, it might be obvious, but uh, we are a local manifestation of the body of Christ in a geographical area, a living organism, a members of an assembly, and uh, a, manifest, a local manifestation of the body of Christ. So the question is, where did people meet in the first century? The reason I bring this up is because uh, early in our ministry, there was a small group of people that believed that uh, we should not have a building. We should not meet in a facility like this but uh, that we should restrict our meetings to uh, homes, that we should just be meeting in homes. And uh, that had the potential of uh, dividing us and uh, the potential of bringing a schism that would not have been uh, a good thing for our assembly. The question is, what does the Word of God teach about where we as an assembly should be meeting? The fact is that in the early church, uh, when the body of Christ first came to existence, they did meet in several different places. A lot of people, a lot of assemblies met in homes. If you look at Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, at the end of Paul's letter to the Romans, he is bidding farewell to some people and some uh, things he says, and in Romans 16 and uh, verse 5, he says, now the God of patience, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in verse ch chapter 15, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 5, likewise greet the church that is in their house, so in, that met in their home. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19. Paul, as he's closing this letter to the Corinthians, says, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much, much in the Lord with the church that is in their home or in their house. We see that again in Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 and uh, verse 15. Colossians 4.15, as Paul is again closing this letter, he said, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. And then and he says the same thing in Philemon verse 2. So uh, we... They, they did meet in homes. There were small groups that met in homes where Paul ministered, where Timothy ministered, where others who understood the grace message ministered to equip the saints for the work of ministry and to teach them sound doctrine. That was the issue. We'll see that a little bit later this morning. And so that was the practice of many, but um, not necessarily all. Uh, in the early church, um, they sometimes, you find some of them actually gathering in the temple. 
uh, in the synagogue. Uh, some people met in, in a school environment, and we see that in the Word of God. The fact of the matter is that um, the church, the religious mindset, is attracted to sacred places. And uh, that's the real problem. The real problem is that the evangelical church, for uh, in large portion, likes the idea of a religious building, a religious mindset, and other rituals that go along with that. Humanly speaking, it makes some people feel closer to God when they're in this sacred building with, uh, you know, pillars and with stained glass windows that perhaps portray certain parts, uh, picture certain parts of the Bible, and uh, places that many times are exquisitely ornate, sacred places. I, um, in my early days as a believer, um, when I went to uh, become the assistant pastor and later the pastor of Judson Baptist Church, we had a beautiful building, loved it. But uh, there was something that now we know was not appropriate and it was the wrong emphasis. There was an emphasis on the mood uh, by the music and by the choir, uh, get you in the mood of worshiping. Uh, I remember one time one of the uh, older members of the assembly in the front of the pulpit, we had a, uh, what we called the communion table. And uh, it may have been me that sat on it. And uh, I got rebuked for that. How could you sit? on the communion table. That's a sacred table where we observe the Lord's Supper, it's, it's sacred. And so I was reprimanded for doing that. Why? Because there was a sacredness to furniture and to the building and the choir and everything else. The fact is that you don't find that in the Word of God. The fact is that Scripture does not instruct us in uh, this area as to where the church should meet. And uh, I find that liberating. It means that we are free to uh, make the best decisions possible about where we meet. Uh, I'm grateful for this facility. Uh, I wish over the years of our time together as an assembly, we've talked from time to time uh, of having a building. The idea is that that gives us a local presence and uh, there's reasons why we have not moved in that direction. One is because our assembly by nature, the people that come physically to our assembly come from all different geographical locations uh, secondly, to have that building, which would do a lot for us, but uh, it's an impossibility. Uh, it, the, the logistics in today's environment to bring people together during the week for youth activities or for Bible study or other events is, is ver almost impossible because of the distances we travel, the traffic and the work schedule and all the other demands. So we have felt very fortunate to be able to have a facility like this where um, we don't have to worry about the roof leaking or the air conditioning going down or the heater does not working and cleaning up after uh, ourselves. And it has provided a freedom because a building does bring a lot of work and a lot of commitment, a lot of time. Others in our assembly have been involved in the building of a facility for the assembly to meet, and uh, they have found that that's very um, demanding. The demands of that are great. It just doesn't work for us, and it is not better for us to meet in homes. It is good for us to meet in a facility that works for us. 
there's, uh, there's no instruction, uh, I believe, in the Word of God that we need to meet in homes. That brings a lot of other issues that uh, we do not necessarily want to face or address. They're unnecessary. Uh, it would be nice if we were a local assembly with a local building where we would invite the community to come in and have ministries that way. The problem is that we face, which the early church faced as well, and that is that the doctrine that we proclaim, the teaching that we proclaim, is not necessarily very attractive to the community, and uh, it will not necessarily draw a lot of people to have a youth program to attract youth and parents. Um, it's, it's a big labor, labor of love, a great ministry in some locations. It just has not fit us. But the issue that I'm addressing was the pressure that we got from some that we should disband from meeting in this facility and that we should all be meeting in homes um, is not where this what this assembly is all about, nor do we find a biblical directive to do that. So that's one issue that we faced early in our ministry. Secondly, it's important to understand that we are committed to the proclamation and preservation of the word of God rightly divided, to preserve that message and uh, to focus on that message, understanding clearly the difference between what is written in the Word of God for our learning and what is written for our application. So Paul speaks about things that are written in the Old Testament, in Israel's prophetic program, that we should not neglect because they are for our learning. But that doesn't mean that they are for our application, and I will elaborate on that a little bit. This, this has always been God's plan, the communication of the word of God to other generations, to future generations, to ensure that the proclamation of the word of God is preserved and that that goes on as a part of the life of the church, the body of Christ. And yet, people have focus on many churches of focusing on everything but the teaching of sound doctrine, focusing on entertainment, focusing on musical productions, focusing on seeking to draw more people uh, any way we possibly can attract them while neglecting sound doctrine. And that's the issue, is neglecting sound doctrine. Yet, that has been the instruction throughout history. Uh, if you look at the God's ministry with the nation of Israel and his program for the nation of Israel, look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, the instructions that God gave early in the history of the nation of Israel and what they should be doing. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Beginning with verse 4, this is a famous prayer in the Jewish religion. Verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And here are the instructions. And these words, these words that God gave to Moses to record, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart, first of all. You will take heed personally to the instructions uh, that I give to you, so the instructions of the word of God. And then he says, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. That's important, so the, the, the teaching of the word of God in the context of the family. And thou shalt teach them diligently, carefully, 
purposefully, intentionally, you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And, and it's, he, here's the emphasis of the role the Word of God plays in the family setting. It's not, okay, kids, it's 6 p.m., it's time for devotions. It's a different, it's a way of life. Listen to what God says. You shall teach them diligently unto your children. You will talk of them when you sit in your house. When are you sitting in your house? Well, typically around meals. You're sitting in your house when you gather together and you're uh, having family time. You will talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. So when you're sitting, when you're walking, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, the point is that this is not an event that you need to schedule. It's a way of life. The Word of God is so important that God says you need to give lifestyle attention to the Word of God. There are many opportunities in raising children to bring a biblical perspective to their lives and what they're facing. So there's a principle here of the Word of God being, here's a term that is used in the secular world, uh, the Word of God being socialized. It's just a way of life. And uh, God wanted the Word of God, His Word, preserved that way, and uh, He wanted to make sure that parents took the responsibility seriously of bringing the biblical perspective to the whole way of life, to everything facing a child's life as they go from toddlers to adults and, and beyond. It's the Word of God that needs to permeate and needs to be part of a way of life for believers. And, and I think that's what God is emphasizing here is that what God is giving to the nation of Israel in His Word needs to be taught, needs to be proclaimed, need to be sure that it's part of life, that there's a biblical perspective to everything that a child encounters, everything that he or she faces, all the situations that he or she faces. It's, what does God say about this? That's, that's the most important. Not what does your teacher say. What does your teacher say in light of what the Word of God teaches? And there may be correction that needs to take place. It's an involvement in the life of children. So God says that to the children of Israel at the beginning of, uh, of their history. And then we have the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here on his earthly ministry. It was a unique, special ministry a, as a, at a unique, special time. And uh, God is preparing the nation of Israel for uh, what lied ahead for the coming kingdom and preceding that, the coming tribulation. And the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples and he taught them how to respond, how to act, how to live during this awful period of tribulation and then how to live and operate during the kingdom program. And so Having done that in his earthly ministry, in Matthew chapter 28, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ says to his disciples. Matthew 28, which is often confused as uh, the great commission for the body of Christ. It is not. It is the commission given by the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve at a specific time, in a specific program. And he says in verses 19 and 20 of Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So here the Lord Jesus Christ in his three-year public ministry, spending all, these, all this time with his apostles, with his disciples, says to them, now uh, he's leaving, there's a commission that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ gives to them and says, make sure that what you have heard of me during this three years together, I want you to keep proclaiming it and uh, to keep teaching, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have taught you. And again, he's preparing them for that tribulation period that the nation of Israel is going to go through and what will be their ministry to Israel and to the nations as a whole and how they should live during the kingdom program. Very specific instructions for that period of time. It will be relevant again once God resumes his program with the nation of Israel. So we have God telling the nation of Israel, I'm giving you my word and I want you to teach my word to future generations, starting with your children and assuming that your children will teach their children and that's the way it will keep, the teaching will keep going. The Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry says, I've taught you all these things, different but consistent with God's prophetic program and I want you now to focus on teaching these things because these are the things that are relevant now. Well, what about the dispensation of the grace of God? What about today? Is a similar command that is given about continual teaching of the things that we have heard from God? There is. Um, so in, we'll look at a few verses, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 3, Paul is um, writing to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, as I besought you to, uh, to stay, to, to uh, abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. There's a doctrine that I want you to teach, which is critical in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And these are the things that you should be preaching to the assembly, chapter 4 and verse 6. If you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. There's a great emphasis of the proclamation and teaching of doctrine. Verse 13 of that same chapter. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Verse 16, take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing so, you will both save yourself and them that hear you. Second Timothy, same thing. Chapter 2 and verse 2. This is the key. This is similar in concept what we saw the Lord Jesus Christ, what we heard him tell his disciples, and what God told Moses to write, and Moses was quoting God to say, teaching these things to future generations. Paul says here, very specifically, thou therefore, verse one, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that is the message, and then, and the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, so, the, so Paul, God gave Paul specific revelation of the mystery, mystery truth. And that's what Paul 
heard directly from God. Now, Paul then, in his ministry and stewardship, gave, proclaimed, taught these things, and he says, the things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, here's the follow-through and the preservation of this message to future generations. The same, commit thou to faithful men, and those faithful men shall be able to teach others also. So that's the teaching of God's revelation, God's mystery program, God's mystery truth from generation to generation today. That has been consistent throughout history, the history of the church. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. What for? That the man of God may be perfect, mature, fully equipped, truly furnished unto all good works. It's the word of God that equips us for ministry, to live life the way God intends for us to live, and proclaiming it to future generations, it equips them to live life the way God intended for us to live it. Chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living, the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, the proclamation of sound doctrine, the word of God rightly divided. God has told us how to study it, how to proclaim it, how to share it with future generations. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, and it actually came during Paul's lifetime, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There will be a, a natural tendency to have a negative response to sound doctrine and the hearing of sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And when they turn away their ears from the truth, they shall be turned unto fables. They will believe something. They'll believe the wrong. They will believe false doctrine. They believe stories and other things. And so uh, the next point, which is very important, is that who are we? Well, we are guarding our assembly from wrong doctrine, hurtful teachings, and a focus on extra-biblical issues, opinions, and speculations. Over the last 25 years, we've had many, and in my lifetime in the church, uh, in the local church, there have been all kinds of peripheral issues, all kinds of uh, specul speculative teaching, which we must protect. We must focus strictly on sound doctrine and the word of God rightly divided. That's what we're about. That's what we're protecting. That's what we're proclaiming. And uh, some of you and some of us have experienced other things like, uh, you know, interjecting politics into the teaching. And uh, I think there are issues about politics that we as Christians need to be aware of and be participants in, but that's not what belongs in the... T we have precious little time each week, precious little time. An hour on Sunday, an hour on Thursday, which we must focus on strictly teaching and proclaiming the word of God. Anything that's peripheral to that is just not beneficiary, uh, beneficial, politics. Uh, issues, as we've heard uh, Steve teach on the King James Version, and uh, issues relating to that versus 
teaching of sound doctrine. We've, we, have, uh, we had a pastor who pastored many of us that, whose focus was on politics and guns and Christians should. You can have your opinion about guns and uh, we can have a discussion about that if you'd like uh, on the side. But this is not the place where we teach on that. Uh, more recently, the issue of vaccines, how that has split many in the church. And there are varying opinions on vaccines and uh, all that happened relating to that. I have strong feelings about what happened, what should have happened, what should not have happened, and so forth. But to bring that into here would not be appropriate. So uh, because that's not who we are, and that's not our mission. God said to Timothy, the things you've heard of me, the same teach to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Sound doctrine. Paul said to Timothy, protect that message, proclaim that message, focus on that message issue that I mentioned earlier, where we meet, the location, the place of where we meet. Uh, I've been in, a, in an assembly where uh, there was a lot of speculation about who the Antichrist was. And the fact that the Antichrist uh, is now somewhere in existence, that may very well be. But God has never told us, uh, through the Apostle Paul, that we need to figure out who the Antichrist is. And there's all kinds of speculative teaching about who he is. I could name some, but I won't. But uh, that is not the focus. Um, others have published things and talked about over, no doubt, over the last 2,000 years about exactly when the rapture will come, a date or a particular. We know it's closer. We know that. Paul kind of expected that it might come in his lifetime. Certainly the Thessalonians did. And where'd they get that from? It's the imminent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture for his body. And uh, Paul had to address that because many were confused in Thessalonica. And they said, wait, so some of our brothers and sisters are dying. They missed the rapture. What's going to happen to them? They expected the rapture to come in their lifetime, and it didn't happen. And people, believers were dying. So Paul addresses that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the order of things, what's going to happen. And so uh, it's not necessary for us. It's not taught to us by Paul's letters that we need to figure out when exactly that's going to happen and who the Antichrist is, and so forth. Um, you know, John taught uh, a, a message on, so what happens after the rapture? Well, from Scripture, that is something that is of benefit for us to know. What's going to happen after the rapture? Biblically, what's going to happen? But uh, what is to us and about us is not trying to figure out what's going to, what, how are people going to explain that millions of people suddenly disappear? They will. Satan has a way to do that. And they'll, they, it, it'll probably be wilder than we can ever think. We see things moving in a direction that uh, gives evidence to the fact that we're getting, it's later than you think. Somebody... Uh, bad message he gave, but he used this illustration. He had a clock, and it went from 1 to 13. And uh, the, the little handle was on the 13, and the big handle was on the 12. And uh, he said, it's later than you think. And uh, that may very well be. Uh, the rapture is imminent. Until that happens, we have a mission. We have a task, a job to do. And that is to complete. Uh, proclaim the word of God rightly divided. So um, all of those things are, are think speculations and things that have been that have come up over a, 
not just 25 years of our history, but 50 years of uh, of my life as a believer. But our emphasis must be sound doctrine, stick to the word of God and teach that the word of God rightly divided. Okay, the next thing is, um, you know, I... There are times when I think, you know, I, I'm a businessman and, and I grew a business. Why can't you grow a church? Well, because we're not a business. And some of the principles that apply to growing a business don't apply to the church growing. How does the church grow? Well, it's, it's believers functioning as those who need to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the grace of God to unbelievers in our specific places where we live. We each have opportunities to share the gospel with unbelievers in the environment that we live, the people that we uh, engage with as part of our lives. That's our role, our responsibility to be ambassadors for Christ, which we'll see in a moment. But uh, the people, the, the principles that are used to create and build a business are not the principles to build a biblical ministry. It's not about public relations. It's not about advertising. It's not about um, uh, PR. Uh, it's not about marketing. Th those are things that work in a business. But uh, we are, we're not an organization. We're an organism, a living, a group of living people who have spiritual life and that have a responsibility and a role. Um, our responsibility is not to build something big and prosperous that has nothing to do with success. The whole church growth movement is fraught with all kinds of traps and things that uh, cause people to do in the church what they shouldn't be doing, emphasizing in the church what they should not be emphasizing. We should be focusing on the teaching of the word of God. The church is the pillar and support of truth. That's the role of the church. It's the proclamation of the word of God. So, next is um, we are dedicated to spiritual growth and development, equipping the saints with, for the work of the ministry, which in summary is ambassadorship and fruitful lives that please God. It's proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God for the reconciliation of ungodly sinners on enemy territory. That's a great principle that we've been taught over and over again. Emphasis that Steve has placed, which is great because it's so biblically based. You go to Romans chapter 5 and you see that we are ungodly sinners, enemies of God, and that's the environment, that's the people that we face as ambassadors for Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we see that Satan has blinded the eyes of the ungodly, of unbelievers. That's what we're up against. But we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that penetrates the heart that is able to penetrate that veil that Satan has placed in the eyes of the ungodly that is able to bring reconciliation to God's enemies. Great emphasis. And that's where we should be living and existing in our responsibility to reach the lost. And so proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God for the reconciliation of ungodly sinners on enemy territory. It's proclaiming Pauline, Paul's grace, mystery, truth. As again, has been so emphasized here. Helping believers to enjoy 
all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. And this, this is a thrilling teaching of the word of God. And that is that we have been given a place in Christ and placed in the body of Christ as adult sons. Why? Th this is key. We are saved and placed in the body of Christ not so that God could be involved in our business, in our business that's very childish, that's immature, that's not clear in the word of God. That's not what God is about in his ministry. It is not about getting God to be involved in our things, but it's loftier than that. It's more glorious than that. It's magnificent, placed as adult sons so that we could be involved in God's business. Do you understand the difference between the two? That is great teaching that we've been exposed to and are so grateful for. And, and yet, the church is plagued, plagued with teaching and practice that focuses on what God is going to do for us. Joel Olstein is the high priest of uh, this kind of teaching. And uh, I'm not encouraging you, you to listen to him, but his, his focus, he summarizes it this way. He says, I wake up every morning thinking and looking for what God is going to do for me today. And the things that God does for him, so to speak, are things that God is not doing at all. I'll give you a few illustrations. He talks about, he teaches thousands of people and thousands of people that God wants prosperity in your life. God wants you to be promoted in your job and we, he will make it happen. And at the end of every message, he says, I believe it and I declare it to be so. Every message, he ends that way. And because he declares it, and because he believes it, doesn't make it so. It's not true. Go tell that to poor believers in other countries, or perhaps even in the United States, who are faithful believers, who are not prosperous, who are poor, who go hungry, and who are persecuted. And it's unfair to tell thousands of people to expect something that God is not doing because invariably they will be disappointed and they will look at the man saying that it's happening to him and wishing that those things would happen to them but they're just not spiritual enough. They don't have faith enough. It talks about prosperity, health for every Christian who believes it and declares it, recognition in the world and recognition in the workplace. Promotion, he talks about promotion in the workplace. You've got to believe God to give you promotion in the workplace. God giving you favor with men. God moving people's hearts so that you get more. This is the opposite, completely contrary to what it means to have an adult sonship placing in the body of Christ where God allows us and enables us to be involved in his business. What is he doing? Not for God to be our servant and doing for us what we want him to do. Um, and the, you know the, the biggest danger of that is that in every message that I've ever heard, and I listened to a few of them just out of curiosity what he was teaching, he starts every, I'm not encouraging you to listen, he starts every message with a funny story. And some of them are very funny, but it's downhill from there. Because then he gets into teaching the word of God, wrongly divided, wrongly applied. Satan knows how to use scripture. If you don't believe that, go to Matthew chapter 4 where he tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. He used scripture in tempting and testing the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and he was wrongly dividing the word of God, wrongly applying the word of God to the situation that Jesus found himself in. So he uses Joseph, for example. And there are some things we can learn from Joseph. As a young man, tested and tempted away from his family, uh, faithful to God, and he gets tempted by this woman, Pharaoh's wife, Potiphar's wife, gets tempted sexually with her daily, over and over and over and over again. What does he do? He finally, he runs away. And if you recall the story, she grabs his coat of many colors and then accuses him uh, to her husband that he came in to rape her. And here's the evidence, his coat of many colors. She got that as he was running away. What does Paul tell us about temptation? Flee immorality. F run away from it. Don't wrestle it to the ground. Joseph is a great illustration of a young man who did that because of his relationship with God. But uh, Joel Olson will take the story of Joseph and say, look, you, we all face terrible things in the world, but God is the God who is going to promote you. Count it, believe it and declare it. God is going to promote you in the workplace and in your community because he did it for Joseph. He was promoted to the number two guy in Egypt and he was in charge of the whole household of Potiphar. And then he faced this terrible trouble. But then God promoted him. And he takes that story, which has a lot of things to teach us for our learning, but then he applies it and says, look, who isn't facing difficulty in life? But like Joseph, God guaranteed, believe it, he's going to promote you. And he's misapplying and wrongly dividing the word of God. Um, he uses Joshua. God says to Joshua, meditate on the things that I've taught you. Teach those things. Rely on God's word. And wherever you go, Joshua, in the assignment that I've given you, you will be prosperous and have good success. So, Joel Olstein says that God promises in his word that you and I will be prosperous and we will have good success. Wherever we go, whatever we touch, will turn into gold. Doesn't work. Because that's not what God did that for Joshua at a specific time for a specific purpose and gave him the promise, Joshua, you're going into the land, you're leading my people into the land. Whatever you do, I'm going to make you prosperous in that endeavor. I'm going to be with you wherever you go, and you will have good success. You will face enemies like you wouldn't believe. I'll be there to protect you. He used Esther, as, um, and, and he gives God names. He's the God of uh, promotion and big purpose. Esther, who was among many women that the king wanted to take a look at, and uh, culturally and as a Christian today, I have a hard time picturing Esther being in all these beautiful clothing and, and made beautiful and competing with all these women in a beauty pageant. And uh, he the king picks her as his queen, and later on, God saves the nation of Israel through Queen Esther. So God is going to do that for you. Just be in the right place at the right time, and uh, God is going to, God is the God of promotion and big purposes. Here's another one more. Uh, he tells the story of Samson. Samson, who was a disaster who gave his life to uh, womanizing, and the strength of Samson was in his hair. That doesn't apply today, obviously. Right, Bill? Uh, so, you know, it, th it had no application to today, but God, th that was the strength of Samson, and he knew it. 
and he gets involved with this woman that knows that that's his strength, and while he's sleeping, she cuts his hair, and Samson suddenly finds himself powerless and a disaster. But then uh, Samson has one more opportunity, his hair grows back, one more thing that, that uh, happens, and when faced with the enemies, Samson takes the pillars of that building and just completely, his strength was such that he was able to destroy those pillars, and the structure came down. Well, the application is uh, God is the God of uh, one more time. So your life may be a disaster, you may, may have been ruined, but guaranteed, one more time, God is going to use you. What guarantee is there of such a thing? So be careful. And the church has done that. The church takes scripture and tells people how God is what God is going to do for them in a daily basis. He tells the story of going, his son needed a, a phone. So he goes to the place and he's going to buy his son an iPhone. The whole family goes. And uh, the end of the story is that, that the son wanted a, an iPhone and, and his daughter wanted an iPhone and, they out, and he, he took his son's phone, which was only eight months old, and then the store manager says, your wife needs a new phone. And he said, no, she doesn't. She said, Her, it's a brand new phone. And he said, she's not going to walk out of here without a new phone. So the store manager says to one of his workers, go get a phone and give it to her. He says, you mean free? He says, yeah. And he walks away with four phones, paid for one, and that was God taking control of the hearts of the store manager and changing his heart. He, he, don't listen to these stories. They're, they're myriads. And it's all about what God is going to do for him. I, it, it's... Uh, you know, he's an interesting storyteller, but that's the problem. And he uses scripture, which is a second big problem, because that's not what God is doing today. We have learned that uh, in the nation of Israel, that uh, the nation of Israel needed to trust in, in the grace resident in, Jeho in the name of God, Jehovah, and the, uh, I am. And then... If you look at the names of God and you see all the things that are associated with Jehovah, there's a lot of names associated with God and it's everything that he would do for the nation of Israel and be to them. Today, it's Paul's grace, grace mystery truth. That's in the mystery and the gospel of the grace of God. That's God's provision for today. And the moment that you start, we can learn a lot about God and what, how he deals with the nation of Israel. But the problem is the church has mixed it, all this up. And the church is mixed up. It's all confused because it doesn't distinguish between what God has said to us and what is written about us in the body of Christ. And to mix the two is tragic. And the church is living, using scripture like I just illustrated, to apply it to today and tell believers that this is all that God is going to do for you today. You don't wake up in the morning wondering what God is going to do for you today. You wonder, what should I be doing? How should I be applying the provisions that God has given to me, the all spiritual blessings that he has given to me, and draw from those riches and draw from what God has provided for us. That's the emphasis. That's the way to live the Christian life. One more question, and that is, where are we going? I, I can only tell you that um, uh, actually, you know, we're dedicated to the Word of God and spiritual growth, and ambassadorship. One more point, number six, where are we going? I can't tell you where we're going. There's a level of uncertainty about our future. I don't know. None of us knows. 
But I can tell you this. I'm grateful, deeply, infinitely grateful for our teaching ministry here and for the teachers that have taught us the word of God rightly divided for all of these years. Our commitment is one through five. We will continue to do that. We will continue to protect this message. We will continue to protect this assembly, equip you with the word of God to be God's ambassadors and to be equipped for every good work. That's our commitment. What about when, when Steve's gone? I talked to him recently, and I said, Steve, I bestow upon you eternal life. Well, <laughs> that's a joke. He, he's, at some point, who is going to then teach? Well, what are we looking for? We, at some point, uh, we're not out doing job interviews to find a, another teacher. We will go, out, go as long as we're able to teaching the word of God. Uh, deeply committed to these principles and always looking aware of the fact that we need to be looking for uh, spiritual leadership and ministry. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's a principle there that I have looked for and that I've applied in uh, bringing qualified teachers for this assembly. And... Uh, you know, we have a unique ministry, a unique message that we have protected, and we always want to be consistent with that. And Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he said, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, a bishop is a shepherd, a teacher, and we find that out from the next verse, if anyone desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work, a bishop then, and there's qualifications, the last one in verse 2 is apt to teach. They need to have, and it, this is not the ability to communicate. It's what to communicate. Apt to teach the word of God rightly divided. And uh, uh, a little less than a year ago, uh, Chad Williams um, and I, we talk, and he said, you know, I have a real desire to teach the Word of God. And we said, great, we'll give him an opportunity to do that. And he taught, uh, and, and we were thrilled about the message that he gave, his ability, and he's young, and uh, he knows I'm sharing this with you. And, uh, you know, he has the desire, he specifically told me, I have a desire to pastor an assembly eventually but uh, under the circumstances that we've had here, which is for the most part not supported and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, we've given him, he will continue occasionally to teach. He's teaching next Thursday. And uh, we'll be sharing a message on the Holy Spirit. And then his message that he taught several months ago on Thanksgiving, he said, how about you teaching that on Sunday, the Sunday before Thanksgiving? It was such an appropriate message. People say, oh, good, we have, well, there's a young lady that got in his heart that's taking him away geographically from here, but uh, it's okay. But that we're looking for somebody who's got, who's got a desire to serve Christ in this way and who's, who has the ability to proclaim the word of God, rightly divided, and who has a heart for people and a heart for the ministry. And that's, I, that's where I can tell you we're going. I don't know. Can't market it. Can't advertise it. it. We will stay faithful to the word of God and to you in proclaiming and protecting this message for as long as we can. And um, it's all of our responsibility to do that. We'll talk a little bit more about that next Sunday. Let's pray together. Father, 